we're continuing the Long Story Short series. If this is your first week with us, we've been on a 13-week trek. We're in week three from the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, and uh, looking at key passages that help us see God's continuous story. I know the Bible is, is made up of 66 different types of literature. We call them books of the Bible, but different types of literature broken down into Old Testament or Old Covenant and New Testament and New Covenant, and it's written by multiple different authors, but it's amazing as those authors were carried along, the Bible says, moved along by the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Bible actually tells one story. One story. And so that's what we've been looking at is one story. And so our hearts are that you will grow in your faith as you begin to connect the dots and as you begin to see some of the foreshadowing that happens in the Old Covenant that points to what Jesus did and also provides an understanding for you for some of the things that we see in the New Testament that they had a history and they had their foundation and their roots all the way back from the very beginning. Now, before we continue, I was looking up long story short, and I found some long story short memes. If anybody know what memes are, these are fun little things. The first one uh, uh, says, I'd love to hear your long story if you make it interesting. So, you know, I, I'm going to try to make it interesting today. I'm going to try to make it interesting today. Another one uh, said that our long story short, it says, funny how those words always seem to come too late. Funny how those words always come too late. How many have ever found that? Somebody says, I've got to, I'm going to make this long story short. It's already been too long, right? It's already been too long. All right, these are not funny. Maybe this next one will be a little more funny. This is about a cat. How many love cat things? So we'll go ahead and throw it up there. Here's the cat thing. Long story short, you're out of toilet paper. Yikes. All right, all right. Today we've been talking, we're in the Exodus, so we're talking about Moses, and so uh, the next one's kind of fun. We can throw that one up there, and, uh, and it says, to make a long story short, we're going to be homeless for about 40 years. <laughs> yeah, that's tough to see, but we're going to be about homeless for about 40 years, so we're going to we're going to talk about that. But again, 13-week trek, uh, and so let's review a little bit. We looked at, at creation. We looked at, at, at God as our creator in week one, and God is powerful. It's been a couple of weeks, so we had a break last week, and, and we talked about in week one that God is, is powerful, that God is purposeful, and that God is personal. And I, I think that, I, I share that this morning and, and just review because I think that in this story that we're going to see in the Exodus, we're going to see the power of God. We're going to see that God has a purpose, that God has a purpose, and we're going to see that God is very personal in the way that he works with the, with the Israelites. And I share that because it connects right from the very beginning all the way till now. That's what we see continually through the Bible is how powerful God is, how purposeful he is, and how personal he is. Amen? In week two, we saw Adam and Eve, they sinned against God. They disobeyed the one command. There wasn't all these rules, it was one. They disobeyed that one command, and by not trusting God, by trusting in their own reasoning, by trusting in what their own eyes saw and, and what they reasoned to be good, sin entered into the world. How many know that's a bad thing when sin entered the world, right? devastating consequences that sin has. And as sin entered the world, uh, God being very personal and loving gave them a promise. He said that there would be a seed that would come that would crush the head of the serpent. Who's the serpent? Satan. Satan's the serpent. God gave a promise and then he offered the first sacrifice and he provided a covering or a clothing from, the very, from his creation that was exposed. Sin had opened them up to guilt and to shame had exposed them, opened them up to fear. They tried to figure out a way to make it and cover themselves and that's oftentimes what we do. We try to do it ourselves. But Jesus said your way to cover yourself, your way to deal with your shame, your guilt, your fear, it's not good. I need to provide the covering and that was involved with a sacrifice a sacrifice and so God clothed them with animal skins and we see the first sacrifice that accompanies a promise and then although that the, the God made that promise wickedness continued to grow right we talked about that wickedness continued to grow until God couldn't deal with it any longer but God is a promise keeping God and so he found a man named Noah who was willing to take God at his word and Noah took God at his word and when God said I'm gonna I'm gonna destroy the earth with a flood here are the plans to build an ark or a big boat because it's gonna it's gonna provide salvation for any who are on it 
Noah took God at his word, and Noah believed what God said, and God opened up, and Noah built this ark, and by it, God preserved humanity and preserved the seed in which he made that promise to Adam and Eve. How many know God keeps his promises? And from there, mankind was spared judgment, and that promise continued in no, to, through Noah's descendants, and then God appeared to a man by the name of Abraham, and he gave him a promise. It was a promise that contained land. It was a promise that contained family. And Abraham left all that he knew, and he took God at his word, and he left everything behind, and he trusted God, and he trusted what God had promised. One of the things that God promised was a family, but here's the problem. Abraham, he was, he was old. His wife was old, and they were barren. They had no kids. So how was this promise going to come about except by a miracle of God? And, and God, over the course of time, fulfilled his promise by giving them a son when Abraham was 100 years old and his wife was 90, right? Who does that, right? But God does, because God is never late and he's always on time and God has the power to fulfill what he has a purpose to do. God has the power to fulfill whatever he says he will do. I believe that's important, friends. You need to hold on to that because that's something we see throughout this story continually is that what God has purposed, he has the power to bring about. What God has promised, he has the power to bring it out. What God has promised, he can bring about. And we're going to see that today as well. We're going to see that today because there was another promise, and that was a promise of land. But the problem was is that Abraham was living in a land, and when he got there, there were other people that were already living in that land. So God, how are you going to give Abraham that land? Well, what we see is God still making that promise to Abraham. And after 25 years, God kept his promise of a son, and God continued to provide a promise. Now, Abraham had lived in that land. And Abraham had his son Isaac. And then the Bible says that, that, uh, that God said about Isaac, I gave you this son, but now here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your one and only son, and I want you to go up to the, on the mountain, and I want you to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. What? What kind of God is that? You ever wonder, what kind of God is that? That says, this is your son. I want you to take, and I want you to sacrifice him. No, no good parent would want to do that. But again, Abraham was taking God at his word, and he believed that God said Isaac was the one in whom the descendants would come in the promise. And Hebrews tells us that Abraham believed that God could even raise him from the dead. And so he took him up, and he tied him down in that sacrifice. And he raised up that knife, and he was about ready to sacrifice when God said, wait, 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 wait. I see that you will not even hold, withhold your only son from me. And he provided a substitute. What we talk about with Passover, what we talk about, a substitute. We see it throughout. This is a consistent thing that we see throughout, forecasting what God would do himself. God had made a covenant. He had walked through, and he said, I will be faithful. I will do it. And we see that he provided a ram in the thicket as a substitute, what? Sacrifice that went along with a promise, and God provided the sacrifice, the substitute for this sacrifice he had asked Abraham to give. And what's he do for you and I? We talked about it in Passover. We're going to look at it today. What does God do? He provides for us Jesus. Friends, this is so critical. We see this throughout the Old Testament and into the New. To really understand what Jesus Christ did, you will see it over and over and over again. That God does something that you and I cannot do on our own. He provides us a substitute for the sacrifice that he wants us to give, a substitute. So the narrative continues. Isaac goes on. He has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Out of the son Jacob, Jacob receives that same promise, that same promise that, that, that Abraham and Isaac had received, that same promise. And then Jacob has several sons. His seventh son is the name Joseph. And Joseph had the favor of his father. And, uh, and his brothers don't like that. They become jealous. We're not going to preach that whole sermon today. But that's a great one. And, and as you hopefully in your reading, you were reading through that whole thing. And eventually his brothers, they want to kill him. They don't kill him. They end up selling him into slavery. He ends up in this land called Egypt. And while he's there, by the hand of God and some circumstances, that go we see from Genesis 37 to 41 that he becomes second in command in Egypt and the problem is is there's a famine 
that comes in the land. There's, there's, a, there's seven years of prosperity, but then there's seven years of famine in the land. And during the time of famine in the land of Canaan, where Joseph was from, there was also a famine in Egypt, and, and Joseph running the show, Joseph had prepared, God had prepared, using Joseph, prepared to meet the needs to, to, to preserve people in, in the famine. And so here is, here's Jacob, and Jacob and his family are in Canaan, and that, that famine went all the way down there, and they didn't have food, and so I hear there's food in Egypt. We'll go up. Let's make some trades. We got some things here. Let's get some food. And his brothers never expect that when they arrive, who are they going to see? Who are they going to see? Joseph. Come on, some participation this morning. They're going to see Joseph, right? What, oh, is Joseph going to be favorable? What's Joseph going to do? But Joseph had a, a bigger view. He, he pulled back, and he understood that the circumstances that were meant for evil, that were meant for his bad, God was really arranging everything and had a purpose. Why? Because God is purposeful, and God was directing him through everything he went through, through everything that he had, so that he could what? Provide food for his family. Why? Because what was God doing? God was keeping his promise. God was keeping his promise. And so here they come, and, 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 and they go back, and they tell the father, Look, Joseph's alive. We told you he was dead. We lied. Oh, boy, we got to come clean, right? We got to come clean. But he's alive, and, and so, so he's going to provide food. And so when they arrive, Joseph says to his family, and hey, why don't you stay here, live here? You can live in the land of Goshen here, and, uh, and here you can live. And, 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 and when you live here, you can be provided for. While you're here, while the famine, we, we can be provided for. We're going to provide land right here. And so Jacob moved his entire family, and they, they went and they lived in the land of Egypt. And this is how Genesis closes out, Genesis 50, 24. Soon I will die, Joseph told his brothers. Jacob died before, but soon I will die. But God will surely come to help you and lead you out of this land of Egypt. He will bring you back to the land he solemnly promised to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. That's so important. That's so important because they were not meant to stay in Egypt. That was not meant where they were supposed to stay for God had promised them that land. So they were going to go back there and Joseph is saying, you're gonna go back there one day. In fact, I'm gonna die. I want you to carry my bones with you when you go back, all right? Carry my body with you. Don't leave me here in Egypt because I wanna claim the inheritance and the promise of God. I wanna claim the inheritance and the promise of God. Of God, And so the opening of Genesis, we have the formation of creation. When we get to Exodus, what we're seeing is the formation of a nation. Because this family that started with Abraham with one son, Isaac, the promised son, and then two sons, Jacob and Esau, and then through Jacob, 12 sons, which become the, the 12 tribes of Israel. And again, you can look through that because Joseph's two sons, Joseph being the one that inherited the firstborn and had a double portion, that's all in there, and you can read through all that culturally and everything. But 12 tribes of Israel, that family grows and becomes a nation. They become a nation. And I believe that when God wants to move his plan forward, we see four ways that God moves his plan forward, not only in the Exodus, but also in our lives. How many know that God has a plan for your life? In fact, Jeremiah prophesies about this, and he says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God has a plan for your life. God's got a plan for your life. God's got a plan for his people. God's got a plan for creation. God has a plan. Some of you need to know that today because in the circumstances you're in, and we're going to see it here, you, you don't know if God has a plan. You're wondering what's going on. I want to tell you that God has a plan. He's got a plan. He's had a plan from the very beginning, and he has a plan as we're going to see through this entire series to the very end. God has a plan. How does God move his plan forward? In the Exodus and in your life, how does God move his plan forward? Number one, God moves his plan forward through his provision. God moves his plan forward through his provision. Exodus 1.1 says this, These are the names of the sons of Israel, that is Jacob, who moved to Egypt with their father, each with his family. Now, that's how it opens. Now, what, what, whenever we hear Israelites, we always put Israelites and, and Egypt together. We're tempted to think of captivity. But I'm going to tell you something. When God led the Israelites to Egypt, it was not to be persecuted. It was for their provision. It was not for persecution. It was not for captivity. It was to provide for them. 
And as I shared a few moments ago, that famine that impacted the entire region from Egypt all the way down to Canaan, and, and there it was, uh, th this family, Jacob, and, and his family whom God had made a promise to, and to his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham, God said, I've got to fulfill my promise. I know there's a famine. I'm in control, but I have a plan for provision for my family. And the way that he provided was by bringing them into Egypt. It was a way he provided for them, and it was also a way in which he could keep them in a place where they could begin to grow and become a family because in Canaan, had they begun to multiply and grow the way they did in Egypt, there might have been a chance that some of these other nations would have saw that, been threatened, and attacked them, and they wouldn't have been strong enough or a nation that could have withstood it. So God brings them into Egypt. And Exodus 1, 6, and 7 tells us what happens. In time, Joseph and all his brothers died, ending that generation. But their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. There they were living in the land of Goshen. Joseph has died. The, 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 the fathers of those generations had died. But God's plan is moving forward. And God is providing for his people. And they are becoming fruitful. And they are becoming powerful as a nation. The land of Goshen in Egypt became the incubator of God's blessing and provision. And when we read verse 7, it should also bring some notable passages to mind. When it talks about multiplied gratefully, great, greatly. Remember back Genesis chapter 1, 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them. And what did he say to them? God said to them, be what? Fruitful and do what? Multiply. What is God doing? They what? They multiplied greatly. Do you see it? The fruitfulness. Be fruitful and multiply. God's command in the garden was to multiply and take dominion. There, there are missionary overtones to what God is saying. We're a missions church. We believe in, in missions, and we believe in the Great Commission, the missions that God has commissioned us to go and make his name great. God desires multiplication. And what is God saying here? Are these missionary overtones be fruitful and multiply and increase? Some of the same words in Genesis chapter 1 get picked up again here in Exodus chapter 1. God's people in fulfillment of the creation mandate being fruitful and multiplying and spreading. Why? What was God's purpose? Why did God do that? Because God wants to be known. God wants to be known. Do you know that? God wants to be known. He, he wants to be known. And how, how has God chosen to make himself known? Well, certainly there's general revelation. We saw that at creation, and Romans talks about that. Through what God has created, we can look around at what God created, and we can go, wow. But how many know there are some people that, that just, does, they don't go, wow. They go, no, there's got to be a scientific explanation for how this happened. You know, and again, I'm not against science. Science helps to, to look and prove that there is God. But sometimes we want to reason by our own reason, reason away what God has done. And, and God is making himself known that way. How many know God makes himself known through his word? As we read his word, God makes himself known through his word. But I'm going to tell you, there's another way that God makes himself and has chosen to make himself known, and that is through you and I. Through you and I. Through what we do. Through his working in our life and the way that we choose to deflect and give glory and honor to God. We make God known. How do we live in relationship with him? We make God known. And so what does it mean that we're made in God's image? Well, in the ancient world, when a king would conquer a territory, he'd put up a statue. He'd put up a flag. He, he'd somehow put some marker that would indicate that this is my territory. I rule. The king or the god, their stories, they'd make up an icon, they'd make up a statue to represent that hero, and they'd say, this territory belongs to me. Here's my statue, here's my flag, I'm putting it in the ground. But what does God do? Well, he wants his icons, but not to be stone or wood or flags, but flesh and blood. Human beings, image bearers, who multiply and increase and spread out that the glory of God might be known. That the glory of God might be known. And God is faithful to the calling he had on Abraham. 
And we see in Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7, we also see that same promise in Genesis chapter 12. And we see it in, in here, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And look at, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great so that you will what? Be a blessing. I'm making you great so that you'll be a blessing. I'm making you great so that you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, curse those, or dishonor those who, uh, that, that, that curse you. And, you you're in, 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 and in you, all families of the earth shall be what? Blessed. God is saying, listen, Abraham, I'm going to put my blessing on you, but not so you can just keep it in, but so you can bless others. Friends, that's missionary. That's missionary. That's what God has called us to do. God has called us to multiply, not for the sense of multiplying so we can stand up and be proud and look at us, but so that we can be a blessing to others around us. And, and, and so here's Abraham. He's in a, living in Babylon. A, he's a pagan living in Babylon, called to come out, a, a land, a, 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 and to have a child. And God says, I'm going to make you great. And God fulfills that. We talked about that in Isaac. And it's the promise of multiplication. And that promise is relayed down to Isaac. I will multiply your offspring. In Genesis 26. In Genesis 28, 14, the promise is given to Jacob. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And then Genesis 46, 3, the promise renewed again to Jacob. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. Notice, where were they going? Down to Egypt. Notice who directed them and said, don't be afraid to go down to Egypt. It was God. Why? Because it was a part of God's plan. God planned for them to go there because God moves his plan forward through his provision. And God used Egypt as a way to be able to provide for his family, provide for this family, provide for what would be this nation, and to fulfill his promise. And unmistakably, as we get there to Exodus 1-7, we understand that they are living under a distinct blessing, the Abrahamic blessing, the promise blessing, that they would increase, that they would multiply, and that they would become a great nation. They came in, and they were about 70 and then as they were there, they grew into the millions because God is providing for his people. This is what the psalmist wrote. Psalm 105, 23 and 24, the Isra then Israel came to Egypt, Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham, and the Lord made his people very fruitful and made them stronger than their foes. Friends, God has got a plan. Trust in the Lord. He's moving that plan forward. But how many of you know that God moves his plan forward through his provision? But sometimes, number two is this, God moves his plan forward through our pain. God moves his plan forward through our pain. <laughs> Exodus 1, 8 to 11, we continue. This is the next verse in verse 8. Eventually a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph and what he had done. I'm not sure it's nothing that he knew nothing about it, but he just chose to ignore what Joseph had done and pretend it didn't happen and wasn't important. And he said to his people, look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we are. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they'll join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from our country. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. Friends, were the Israelites out of God's will? No. No. They were living under the distinct blessing of the Lord. And, and yet they went from favor to disgrace, from protected and, and privileged people to persecuted people. I don't know about you, but it doesn't seem right. I often go, God, why do you do that? Why are you doing what you're doing? If you have blessed them, if you led them here, then why are they experiencing this pain? And I can tell you that there are some of you that have experienced that same thing. You know Jesus, you know the word, you put your faith in Christ, you put your faith in God, and yet somehow, even in the midst of being obedient and serving the Lord, you have found that pain has come into your life, trials have come into your life, and they often are mingled together, the circumstances, the blessing and the pain, they're mingled together and you're trying to make sense and go, God, I don't understand. But God's people are living under his pronounced blessing and at the same time experiencing pain, difficulty, and bitter circumstances. But I want you to see something. See, God is personal. God is with them in the pain. He hasn't left them. He hasn't left them. Exodus 1.12. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. <laughs> 
through the pain, God is still blessing. It's hard to see God at work in our pain, isn't it? When we're going through pain, it's hard to see God as, at work. But I'm going to tell you, as we follow this story along, we're going to see that the moving the plan forward, God used the pain the people were going through to move his plan forward. And he was about to show up in a big way so that the whole world would be able to see the power of God. God speaks to the Israelites in the midst of the pain. He sends Moses to speak to them and to Pharaoh. And the first time Moses speaks to Pharaoh, how many know things don't get better, they get worse? Moses comes back. The people are all excited. God has heard us. He sent us to deliver. Moses goes in and talks to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's like, uh-uh, we aren't letting them go. In fact, these people, we're going to make it harder on them. We're going to make it harder on them. Oftentimes, it's difficult. The situation goes from bad to worse. But friends, it was still a part of God's plan because God advances his plan through our pain. God was setting the Israelites up to know him personally, not only to know him personally, but to see his power and his provision and to put the nations around them on notice. Exodus 6, 2 through 8, God spoke to Moses and said to him, and this is this wonderful promise, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, the Lord, I did not make known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Remember covenant? Covenant is that promise. It's a promise that God made and that God will fulfill. Remember my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. God is personal. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land, because God's a promise keeper. I'll bring you in the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. Why? Because I am the Lord. Man, there are some powerful statements made in the midst of pain. God says, I'll establish, he establishes, I'm the same God. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want to tell you something. If you're in the midst of pain, God is advancing his plan. He has not stopped. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His promises for you are the same as they were before. They have not changed. They have not changed. They have not changed. Secondly, God has not forgotten you. Notice, in the midst of the pain, he says, I've heard their groaning. I've heard their prayer. Sometimes we pray and we go, God, I, I just don't know if you hear me. I'm still in the midst of this pain. They were still in the midst of the pain. I don't know if you're hearing this. And God's saying, yes, I hear you. I hear you. I'm working. You don't see me working, but I'm working. I'm working in the midst of your pain because I'm advancing my plan forward. Trust me. Trust me in your pain. And here's the truth I want you to receive if you're in the place of pain. God has not forgotten his promises. He's not forgotten his promises to you. There they were, but he's still working his plan. He's still working his plan. And even in the midst of our pain, God has a plan, friends. He will often use our pain to grow us and to push us out of our comfort zones because pain has a purpose. Did you know pain has a purpose? Pain has a purpose. Pain has a purpose. Sometimes pain moves us out of a place where we're stuck, right? I mean, let's be honest. If we really look at this, when, they, when, when, when Moses showed up, the Israelites were in pain. But let's be honest, when Moses shows up and he's like, God's going to deliver you, and he delivers that news, it was not good news to Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh liked the comfort of knowing that he had the Israelites under his thumb. And so Pharaoh reacted when Moses pushed his comfort zone. And when Pharaoh reacted in the comfort zone of the Israelites, or they had been accustomed to the provision of Israel providing for the bricks and all of that kind of stuff, their whole, their whole provision of everything they trusted, and they were trusting in Egypt, they weren't trusting in God. That, that's really what we see. In fact, as they're coming out, you're going to see this as a regular pattern, even as they're coming out, even when they get into the wilderness, when things get difficult, what, is, what do they say? It was better for us where? Egypt. Why? Because Egypt is who they were trusting, not God. Egypt had become their God. They had transferred their trust in God to their trust in Egypt, even though Egypt was oppressing them, even though Egypt was providing them pain, even though Egypt was, was, was keeping them bound. They were comfortable there. And so the pain they were in and what God was about to do was to move them out of their comfort zone so that they would transfer their trust to God rather than Egypt. 
There are some of you that you are in captivity. You are bound by sin. You put your faith in Jesus, but there are certain things. You are still bound. You're still bound in circumstances. You're still bound in addiction. You're still bound in things, and you're like, ah, ah, ah. And every time it gets a little difficult, you cry out to God. God begins to move. It gets a little uncomfortable. You go right back. Because where's your trust? What meets your need? What brings you peace, even if it's temporary? What brings you pleasure, even if it's temporary? What masks the pain, even if it's temporary? What you've been bound in, what you've been holding on, because Satan is a liar. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes to steal. We're going to see that in a moment. And I want you to know that, that pain oftentimes is what will move us out, what will move us to hold God, what will move us to trust God. God is moving through pain. And he's going to redeem them. He says, I am, I am, I am, I am. I'm going to reveal myself as the great I am. Why? Because God is powerful. But he says, I'm powerful, but I'm personal. And I want you to be my people. And I'm calling you. I'm going to be your God. And I've got a purpose and I've got a plan because I'm personal and I'm purposeful and I'm powerful. And I'm about to show you all of that, even in the midst of your pain. Thirdly, God moves his plan forward through our obedience. Exodus chapter 1, part of Pharaoh's plan to keep the Israelites down was to kill all the baby boys that were born. Exodus 1, 17, but because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live, too. I don't want to make a political statement, because this isn't politics. But friends, if you take a look at what's happening in our nation right now, the atrocity and the decisions that are being made, this is not new. This is not new. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You've got to see beyond politics, and you've got to see Satan underneath it all, because Satan's goal is to snuff out a generation. Satan's goal is to snuff out. That's why we have Momo Challenge. If you don't know what that is, you can Google it and look it up. And and these, these things that are popping up, even in social media and little cartoons and things for kids and everything else, causing them to harm themselves and even kill themselves. Why? Because Satan wants to kill. He's been doing it throughout. This is not a new thing. And here's Pharaoh. He's thinking, oh, I'm just on her thumb. No, he is working under what the enemy has been trying to do ever since the beginning. Kill, 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 kill. That's why it was such an atrocity for the the nations that were living in Canaan. And God is giving it to, to his people instead of that because they were sacrificing children. Human sacrifice was going on. There is judgment when we don't respect life. There is judgment. It's why we need to pray. It's, it, this, is, this is a spiritual battle. You can hold up signs. You can post things all over Facebook. But I'm going to tell you something more powerful than that is if you get on your knees and you begin to pray. You begin to care. You begin to say, you know what? I'm going to pick up an orphan. I'm going to adopt. I'm going to actually get involved and do something. I'm going to love people. Because the enemy, this is the enemy. And that, that, that's what, but, but the midwives, what do they do? They operate in obedience. They operate in the fear of the Lord. Their obedience opened the door. And what did their obedience open the door for? Who was the one that God had called, you know, he, he had prepared, but there, there next to that, that fire that did not burn up in the wilderness, the, the you know, the, the burning bush. Come on, we've, you've seen it. What is it? Who is it? It's Moses. And what happened? The fear of the Lord. They didn't kill Moses. Friends, I'm telling you, we've got to pray because there are some Moses that will bring about revival that the enemy wants to snuff out before they even have an opportunity. But when God's people are obedient, he moves his plan forward through our obedience. And he moved his plan forward by the obedience of Moses' mother who wasn't about to do what the king of Egypt had said to do because it contradicted what God said. And she was willing to stand her ground, and then she was willing to say, it got to the point, I can't keep him quiet anymore. I don't know what to do. I'm going to trust the Lord. And she put him in a little basket, and she floated him down the river. And what happened? The son, or or the daughter of of, of Pharaoh himself, heard him cry and drew him out. Why his name was Moses, drew him out of the water. 
and what God would do using Moses, draw the Israelites out of Egypt. Why? To draw them to himself. And God draws us out to draw him, to draw us to himself. And God had a plan, but the plan came through obedience. It came through obedience. Friends, if you will trust God and walk in obedience, you will see the deliverance from your pain. You will see the deliverance from your captivity. But you've got to begin to walk in some steps of obedience. You've got to take some steps of obedience. When God says to do this, you've got to be willing to do it. Oh, but it's so hard. Yes, it is. Because there's a sacrifice. Whenever there's a promise, there's a sacrifice. And sometimes you've got to sacrifice. Fourthly, God moves his plan forward through his power. Exodus 6, 6, and 7, Therefore say the people of Israel, I'm the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment, and I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord. How much of this is about Israel and what they can do and their strength? None of it. This is about what God's going to do. God has the power. He's going to deliver them. He's going to rescue them. He's going to redeem them. He's going to bring them out by an outstretched arm and by great acts of judgment. It's not to be started by a revolt. They're not going to try. That's what Moses tried in his own strength. He tried a little revolt. I'm Moses. I'm going to kill this guy, and, and I'm going to bring him. I'm going to be the deliverer. No, it didn't work out, did it? No, you can't do it in your own strength. You can't do it in your own strength. It's not about your strength. It's about you learning how to surrender and walk in obedience to God. It's about you learning how to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. You learning how to walk the steps that God and put your trust in God. It's about your faith in God. That's what it is. It's about your faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what it is. His power. His power. Not by might later on. Not by might nor by power. But what? By my spirit, says the Lord. It's not by our strength. It, it was some trust in horses, right? Some trust in riders, right? Some, some trust in these things. They trust in armies. But, but I will trust in the Lord my God. That's what the Bible says. That's what the song, I will trust in the Lord my God. Friends, we've got to learn how to trust in the Lord. Why? Because God's about to demonstrate his power. Now, I don't have time to read because this is a long story short. And I've already gone long enough. Chapter 7 through 11. You see God's power on display. Plague after plague after plague. You say, why would God do that? Because every one of the plagues is tied to an Egyptian god or goddesses. They, they worship multiple deities. They worship multiple deities. So when it talks about the plague of flies, God was demonstrating his power against the god of the flies that they worshiped. Every one of those, the, the god of the, the, the Nile, all, every one of these plagues demonstrates God's power over the gods of the Egyptians. He is demonstrating his power. He's saying, I'm more powerful. I'm more powerful. I'm more powerful. I'm more powerful. And then in the midst of it, he spares his own people from those same plagues. So you have, the, you have it happening to the Egyptians all around and the land of Goshen where the God's people are at. It's not happening. Plague of darkness everywhere else except the land of Goshen. Hey, you know, you get the gnats. You got all these things coming in. The cattle all dies. And the economic, the, the, where, where Israel was looking to, or Egypt was looking to all these other gods for their economic security, God undoing it all. Undoing it all. Step by step. Step by step. Demonstrating, I am the Lord. I'm the Lord. And so what's he doing? He's undoing everything, every other God the, the Egyptians relied on. You know what God does in our lives? He tries to undo what every, every other God we worship, we lean on, every other idol we lean on, every other thing we trust. Sometimes God begins to remove it so that we can truly trust him. So we can truly trust him. And God's showing that he can rescue them even in the midst of their pain that he's rescuing them. And he doesn't just provide in the midst. He, he wants to deliver them out of. And so we talked about it during communion, so I won't go into it with the, with the plague of the firstborn and the Passover lamb points to Jesus Christ and what God's going to do through the lamb of, the God, lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But then Pharaoh finally says, get out of here. After that last one, get out of here. Exodus 13, 17, and 18. And when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near, for God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led them around by way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. God was directing, but he didn't direct them the way he thought they should go. In fact, he, he, he directs them a different way and gives a perception to Pharaoh, gives a perception to the people that Moses didn't know what he was doing. Oh my goodness, we've got to choose another leader. This leader doesn't know what he's doing. But God was directing the whole time. 
Why? Because he's about to show them one more great act, one more mighty act of what he's about to do. And so he leads them by way of the Red Sea, and it looks like it's a dead end, and the Red Sea is there, and the, the, the armies of Egypt are pursuing them behind. And in Exodus 14, 10 to 12, when Pharaoh drew new that people lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly, and the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt? that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to bring us out of Egypt? Is not what we have said to you in Egypt, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? How many times do we do that? There's too much pain, this is terrible, I don't see a way out, I don't know. I wanna go back there. That's my comfort zone. I wanna go back there. It was better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. That's the problem. The problem is still in their hearts. God's trying to deliver them out of Egypt, but their heart is still in Egypt. Their heart is still in Egypt. They weren't trusting the Lord. It's better. It's better for us to live in captivity. It's better for us to live in slavery. It's better for us to live, even though it's painful and we don't like it, it's better for us to serve there because this is just too hard. We don't know what this is like. Friends, some of you are still in captivity because you don't know the salvation and the freedom that God wants to bring to your life, and you still think that's better. You still think that pleasure, you're believing all the lies of the world that tells you that way, that life is better, that's normal. Listen, that's not normal. That's, that, that, is, that is keeping you bound from God's plan. God's got a plan. They didn't know the freedom he was offering was better than their circumstances. And there are some of us that are the same way. God wants to bring you greater freedom than the filth you've been living in. Moses tells the people this, Exodus 14, 13 and 14. Moses said, fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be silent. God was going to fight for them. God was going to deliver them. Why? Because he made a promise and God keeps his promises. He made a promise to Abraham. He made a promise to Isaac. He made a promise to Jacob. He renewed that same promise. It was the same promise he renewed over and over and over. It was the promise that Joseph had held on to and told them to hang on to. And he has the power to make good on his promises if we will trust him. And we will move forward in faith. Moses was told to stretch out his staff. When he did, what happened? The waters parted. God displayed his power. The waters of the Red Sea parted. The land, the, 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 the land underneath was dry land, and that bed, they, they walked across on dry land. When they got to the other side, Egypt started to pursue, and God said, pull down the staff. Boom, the waters came. Man, their enemies were destroyed. There was freedom. Why? Because God has the power to bring about what he has planned. And this is what we see over and over again in Scripture, that God has the power to bring about what he has planned. God has the power to bring about what he has promised. God has the power to bring about what he has planned. You might be in the midst of pain. You might find yourself in the midst of addiction. You might find yourself of being bound. But let me tell you something. Jesus Christ has promised you freedom. Jesus Christ has promised you life. You don't have to live under that death. You don't have to live in that captivity. There is freedom. Whom the Son has set free is what? Free indeed. Free indeed. Free indeed. That's a promise from God and you can live in that promise you can live in that promise if you're in the midst of pain God is working through your pain why because God has the power to do so God can bring about the deliverance that he has planned for your life and that's what we see in Exodus we see God providing we see God directing and moving his plan forward through pain we see God we see God at work demonstrating his power in our lives. And we see God demonstrating that when people are willing to trust him in faith and be obedient to what he encourages and says, this is what you are to do. This is what you're to do. That's an act of faith. When you obey the Lord, it's an act of faith saying, I trust you. 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 Friends, I don't know where you're at today. I don't know the pain that you're in today, whether it's pain that's been caused by your own decisions or whether you uh, are are just experiencing what happens when it rains on the just and the unjust alike, right? Uh, Sometimes that happens. We live in a broken world, and I don't know the pain that you're in. I don't know what you're, but God has a plan, and God is moving his plan forward. The question today is, will you trust him? Will you trust him? Will you trust him? When he asks you to take a step of faith, will you be obedient and take that step of faith? Will you trust him? 
Will you trust him? And that's where we're at today. And that's my, that's what I want to close with this morning is just with that question. That question today. Do you need to trust, where, what do you need to trust the Lord with? What do you need to trust the Lord with? Maybe you need to trust the Lord for your salvation today. Maybe you need to trust the Lord for your salvation. Maybe you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ today. Maybe you need to recommit your life. You, were, you made a commitment to follow Christ, but now you've just been serving your own self. And you say, you know what? I need to renew that commitment. I need to come back to Jesus. Maybe you're in the midst of pain and you need to trust the Lord even in the midst of the pain that you're in so that you can see his power and you can see his deliverance as he's moving his plan forward. What, what do you need to trust God for today? What do you need to trust God for today? Let's bow our heads this morning. Thank you, Jesus. If you're here and you say, you know what, I need to trust God for salvation today. I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ. I need the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I need salvation. And today I want to invite Jesus into my life. I want to be born again today. I want to invite Jesus to come into my life. I need salvation today. Will you slip up your hand this morning? I need salvation today. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? I need salvation today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Thank you. Hallelujah. If you need to recommit your life to Christ, maybe you, you, you did it one time, but you say, you know what? I need to come back to Jesus. Will you slip up your hand? I need to recommit my life to Christ. I want to recommit my life to Jesus today. Yeah, I see that hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, for those of you that raised your hands, I'm just going to lead you in a prayer, but it's really a prayer of faith today, and it's a prayer that you're making. You're taking that step of obedience. I commend you today. And let's pray today. Will you pray with me, and will you just invite Jesus into your life today? Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, I thank you today that you love me and that you gave your life for me. I ask you today to forgive me of my sin and to come into my heart. I ask you today for your salvation. I put my faith in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we just celebrate today with those that raise their hands today? Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you say, you know what, I'm in the midst of pain today, and I need to trust the Lord. I'm just struggling to trust. Will you lift up your hand today? I want to pray for you. I need to trust the Lord. Yeah, yeah, right here. Jesus, we trust you right now. There's hands all over in the midst of pain. You're working your plan. You're working your plan. You're working your plan. Mm -hmm. Father, whatever trust issues we have, we just, we trust you. We trust you. We trust you. We trust you. We trust you today. We trust, we don't understand it, but we trust you. We don't know what you're doing, but we trust you because you're a promise-keeping God and you've got the power to move your plan forward. So God, whatever it is, whatever you want to do in and through this trial that we're in or this pain, Lord, we want to hang on to you. We don't want to go back to Egypt. We don't want to take a step back. We want to keep moving forward in faith, seeing the deliverance that you promise, seeing the deliverance you promise today. Lord, I pray you would do it for these with their hands raised today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's stand, and we're going to close. And if you raise your hand or you want prayer today, maybe you got a situation you're up against, you want prayer, the prayer team is going to be up here. I'd love to invite you to come. If you gave your life to Christ, I'd love to meet you right up here. I'd love to talk with you about salvation. I'd love to talk to you about your relationship with Jesus today and how to help you take those next steps this morning. Come on, will you come as we sing? And let's just close just with worship to the Lord today.